So this is how we get up to the flight deck. I have not been up here in so long. So we're coming up here. Like I said, hopefully I can remember everything. So this is how you would actually, during a war, how you going through the spar into the little back area back there. Okay, well, looks like we've got some little things for probably running the flaps or something like that. That's probably where the flaps run. Of course, we have to have our compulsory British flag. A um, little electrical thing, reverse current relays, voltage regulators, all sorts of little things there. These all look very American. So, uh, And then, obviously, here, you can get in and out of the wings. This would be for the port wing. I don't know if I, I haven't been in here forever, so it's... Anyway, <laughs> you wouldn't go very far through there, but you could actually get back in there a little bit. I think I got a little light here. Yeah, so you can actually see back there. And, uh, you know, you can get back there and check little things. I, boy, you have to have a freaking small person. So, anyway, let me get that little black. Okay, so that's that over there. Uh, back here we've got behind the flight engineer's panel. A bunch of electrical stuff. This all looks a little bit more modern here. Um, of course, this closes down here for acting as a door. Okay, so I can walk on that. Keeps the riffraff out too, all the drunk passengers. Anyway, so here's the flight engineer panel. I have not been in this thing in so long. Okay, so we've got fuel tanks. Fuel tanks, there's tons of fuel tanks. Looks like there's five fuel tanks on each side. We've got fuel. We got more there. Anyway, um, what else have we got here? Electrical generator panels. We got your manifold pressure gauges for each uh, engine. Altimeter, two fuel flow indicators for number one and two port, three and four here. Okay, we got tachometers for the four engines. We got our three and one gauges for the three engines. So we got the well pressure, oil temperature, fuel pressure. We got our cylinder head temps for the four engines and we got our carb uh, air temp for the engines. Um, let's see what we got here. Let me turn the light on. Bal that's probably a, a balance thing for the fuel, you know, so uh, maybe the tanks balance back and forth. Carburetor heat controls so they're in cold. Hot would be up that way. Cabin air. That's a shot of the panel with a light. So this guy back here would just monitor the the uh, the engines and uh, and transfer the fuel around you know or not transfer it around but make sure that it was uh, you know the, the engines were running so the pilot didn't have to worry about it. Um, this was a, requ a required crew position. There's a little better shot of the electrical panel box there or the box actually. And uh, right down here just uh, behind the uh, Engineers panels. We've got a an APU that we can use to start the uh, uh, the engine, or you know, kind of get the batteries going, start the engines, you know, instead of running them straight off the batteries. Anyway, so now moving up into the cockpit, I don't know exactly what I can't remember what all these are for, but they could be. What would those be for? Anyway, they open and close something. Um, it says shut and open. I don't know, it could be cow flaps. Might be might be the cow flaps, but you'd think there would be four if, if that's what it was. Anyway, a couple of fire extinguishers down here, a little step to get up. Okay, so coming up to the cockpit. There's the panel. Oh my god, this looks so simple compared to the Mars. Anyway, so there's the flight engineer uh, in the back there. There's a little bit of a navigator table here, passenger seat, um, and um, this hatch 
right here is how we, I believe this hinges before I hit myself in the head. Yeah, it hinges to the side. Okay, why is it not opening? There we go, that's what I thought. Okay, so now believe it or not, the pilot does not start the engines. The flight engineer does. And here's the panel, okay? So we've got uh, priming switches for the, you know, four, three, two, one. We've got the, uh, the primer deal. And here we've got the induction vibrators. I thought the start switch was here. No, you know, I'm thinking maybe we'll check, but maybe the pilot starts turns them and but the flight engineer basically is the one that's looking out here starting the engines so the, the flight engineer standing up here literally like i'm looking out here and he's starting number one you know and he goes over here and then he starts number four you know and then we usually do one four three uh two three or you know four one three two is basically the way we we start um I don't want to get out too much, but you can walk up on the top here. You can see the big covers there where the fuel tanks are. And if you look out here, you see uh, on this side there, there's the two little rings up there, the little clips and stuff. And actually there's two little doors there. And if you unhook those and you can uh, unscrew something under there, that whole leading edge drops down and becomes a horizontal work stand uh to work on each side each engine has one on each side and like i said those little things in the back there you can add something to the front on each side then you can add something that goes across there so imagine working on this thing in the winter in england with uh you know the the airplane bobbing up and down we've got everything covered off the airplane rarely sits outside we just had a big event and that's kind of why i wanted to uh you know, get an opportunity to do this. That's kind of looking down the nose. You know, see the flight. Do a bit of a, a view around. Seaplane base is going to be down there where that second windsock is, down to the right of the trees. Got our C-47, that airplane and this airplane. We both flew back from England across the pond. Wait a second. Okay, so... There we go, there's that one, there's that one. Yeah, I don't think the birds can get in now. Anyway, so, you know, people ask me, Colonel, when are gonna fly this thing again? Well, we always have the opportunity to do that. There's no question, the intent is yes. But let me tell you something, we're focused on other things right now. I need to create a sustainable business. I've got a great model that I'm working on, starting with Act 3, I've got big plans. Um, and the reality is we can always get running uh, the airplane's going to need, obviously, a lot of work. Carburetor's going to have to get all the hoses changed. Uh, you know, take a serious look at everything. Um, but it's going to be a little more practical to operate when we have a flying boat base down there on the, uh, uh, on the, on the lake, very close by with a ramp close by. And so here's the deal. I've flown it across the Atlantic. I flew the Olympic torch in it. I've flown numerous air shows. I flew two years, like every day, straight at Oshkosh in 1994 and 1995, and I flew back to Florida, been there, done that, I've moved on to other things, this thing could fly again, and, uh, you know, for the people that say, you know, hey, Kermit, you know, you know, everybody, I get these comments, you know, hey, you got to keep it flying, you got to keep it flying. Well, let me tell you something, I'm saving it for your great-grandkids, okay? Think of it that way, okay? So anyway, this ladder here, I can't remember exactly where it goes because when we step up to get out of here you actually just step up like this to get out uh, this down here actually is the control locks okay and I believe we'll see if that works I can actually move the controls there we go I can't believe I remembered all that so that locks everything off so up here we got uh, pilot and the co-pilot seat my god that panel is simple oh my god anyway so here's the throttles and uh the throttles are actually interesting they're actually hydraulic and there's a man that anyway they're jammed up anyway so 
so anyway, they have a hydraulic system in there, so it's hydraulics that actually run the, the, the not the cable, but the, oh man, I don't know if this guy, there we go, okay, to be able to, uh, to operate the throttle out of the engine. So sometimes when you're actually flying along, you actually have to like pump these things to get the air out of them. Before you start, you actually pump the throttles a bunch of times. I can't believe I can remember all this stuff. I haven't been, a, I haven't flown this thing since 19... 90, whenever the Olympic, oh, 1996, that's the last time I flew, 06, 16, it's been 20, 22 years, 22 years since it's flown, it's almost 23, anyway, here's the uh, mixture controls, idle cutoff, auto lean, auto rich, emergency rich, these are the, uh, for the propeller RPMs, they're Hamilton standard propellers, but apparently, and I'm going from memory here, they obviously uh, increase and decrease. You can gang bar them if you want to drop them all down at the same time. Like if you were setting up for takeoff and you just took off and you wanted to just drop them down to kind of get them in the major range, the co-pilot could go like that. Then you could tweak them individually. And basically, you know, when you sink a multi-engine airplane, what you do is, is you kind of you get them in the ballpark and then you take two, like the outboards, and you sit there and you go, wah, 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 wah. and then you're listening to the other two, two and three that are out of sync, and then you're going, wah, 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 wah. and then you sink after you get the outboards synced, and then you get the inboards synced, then you got to sync the inboards with the outboards. Anyway, it's not as hard as it sounds, but, uh, but it's kind of cool. Rudder bar, <laughs> guess what? There's no brakes. <laughs> Anyway, there's a little bit of an adjustment there. You could spin that and adjust that forward or backward. Uh, basic flying panel, you know, airspeed, artificial horizon, altitude, let's zero it. Although technically, fantasy flight's 144 feet above sea level. Turn and bank, rate of climb indicator. Uh, here's the engine. So the pilot has all the engine instruments as well. Uh, second set of flying panel for the co-pilot. Uh, here you've got your... Man, this thing's old. This was part of, I think, the autopilot system. Yeah, because here you can adjust it. Uh, artificial horizon and the directional gyro. Uh, we came over on, basically, uh, I think we had like three GPSs. We had uh, like a brand new one that I bought and like two backups, you know. Uh, we had antennas kind of stuck here and there. And, and it was, yeah, it worked great, you know. I mean, it would have been completely different had you been, uh, you know, <laughs> shooting stars out of the panel up here or looking for sun lines, you know. Uh, that, 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 that would have been up there if you, if you wanted to, you know, do that kind of stuff. Um, so that's basically it. Now, something that I just, I kind of feel like I want to explain here that's kind of interesting is when you first, when I first got in this thing and I went to fly it, this panel here was just, you see how it's kind of bulged and curved? There really wasn't a horizon, okay? And so when we, so when I went to, you know, take off for the first couple of times, you know, it was like I'm pushing the power up and blah, 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 and not realizing that I'm digging the left float in the water because the engines are turning this way. The whole airplane wants to turn this way, so you got the torque digging that float in there. So ultimately, what we ended up doing was, because there wasn't really, you got a curved nose up there and you couldn't really tell what it was, we just added this friggin' piece of string up here. So that's our, that's our artificial horizon. And I think when it's taken off or something based on the height of this was chosen because for some reason the nose on the horizon, you can kind of use that as a, as a reference. So, um, oh, I forgot all of this stuff. Okay, so here's the emergency fuel shutoff valves. There's your elevator trim. Here's your rudder trim up there, okay. Uh, this is an emergency. Uh, that, I believe, that's the tail mooring release, okay. So that's, that's basically the glider hitch back there uh, when we disconnect when we're more or we're launching this thing, okay. And uh, here we've got your... Uh, uh, you got your mag switches, so you know here they are here. But there's a master deal, so if you want to shut both of these engines off, it's a kind of a safety deal, you know. So that's both left, right, off, and then when it's out, it's off anyway. So this wouldn't work unless that was in. So that's there over here on the uh, starboard side. We've got the feathering switches for one, two, three, four. 
Um, what is, oh, these are the fire uh, things. So we basically got uh, two fire bottles per engine. Okay, we've got our lights up here on a collision nav, streaming, strobes, floodlights, rheostats, we've got pedo heat here. Um, no smoking in the seatbelt sign. The steward call is the most important. Uh, after we land, she brings up the naked in Jamaica rum. Of course, it could be a cabin boy as well. I don't want to be politically incorrect. And, uh, you know, it doesn't matter who brings the rum as long as it gets brought. Um, and then those are the emergency fuel shutoff valves. Uh, fire test resets. So you can actually test these and make sure that uh, these little fire warning lights uh, come on when... Uh, you know, when you're testing them and stuff. So anyway, so so when you go to start this thing, like I said, if the down, uh, the shoreline's over here, we would start number four first, so we would start turning this way away from shore. Hopefully, once it got going and it was running, everything looked pretty good, then we would start working on this one, all the while thinking, okay, what if we can't get this one started? What are we going to do, okay? So anyway, basically, uh, you know, once those are running, now you can steer it. Like I said, there's no brakes. You're moving. And what we would generally do is we would uh, uh, get them all four started. And obviously, the outboards would be warmed up first because those are the ones that we would use because we need them for steering. And what we would do is we would uh, basically, I think we would go upwind, you go into the wind depending on how much lake we had okay so if it was a smaller lake we would go into the wind and we would do the engine run-ups on one and four so i would run up one and four here on the on the throttles the flight engineer would back there he would check everything or maybe i think my co-pilot would check everything because i can't remember if he had mag switches back there so we would check things up here you know do the mag check run them up to 30 inches uh they're probably up around 2300 rpm when we're doing the mag checks uh do the feather and make sure everything feathers and pull those out and stuff you know as far as far as part of the the, the you know the engine run-up checklist and then and then after we'd gone into the wind and we'd gone to the other end of the lake we would turn around and then we would go downwind and we would run up two and three okay so by the time we got all done there now we're ready to turn into the wind for takeoff okay this airplane when I brought this down from uh, from uh, Oshkosh Prior to that time, I had pretty much unlimited water, okay? And I'm coming into a lake here where I've got 6,000 feet in two different directions. So when we first brought her down from Oshkosh, I had a mooring buoy set up in a lake south of here that was actually 12,000 feet long. So we landed there, you know, I was like a seven-hour flight from Oshkosh or something. We landed there. Oh, man, did we celebrate. That was the end of a very long trip. A lot of champagne, jumping off the wingtip. I think some bathing suits might have fallen off at some point as well. But we had a great time. We were really partying. And uh, then uh, we ended up, uh, I don't know why, but my train of thought just went off to another world. Anyway, so we operated out of that lake for a while. And part of the problem was I still, it was a year before I got the seaplane ramp put in, you know. So we had it down there for a while. I, I wanted to know what did the airplane take to get it in and out of the water and that kind of stuff. And so what I did was, is I went out with a GPS, I had a ski boat, and I set buoys up every 500 feet from the shoreline. Okay, and I went out, and it was interesting because I, what I learned was, this thing will break water at 65 knots. What I learned was, is the fact that by the time I put the right float as closest to the shore as I could, safely, you know, and not run aground, what happened was by the time I turned and I was basically kind of about lined up, you know, to take off, I'd already burned up 500 feet, okay? And with a light wind, this thing would break water at 65 knots at, uh, in another 2,500 feet. So we were out of the water in 3,000 feet. And so with Fantasy Flight, I realized wasn't gonna be a big issue. And we flew it out of here a number of times, but we always made sure that we were light. You know, we had like quarter fuel or something like that, which is still four hours of fuel. And, uh, and basically, you know, didn't carry a lot of passengers. Um, and so that's kind of how we flew it out of here. So once we got it lined up, you know, and like I said, it would break water and 3,000 feet, we were up and flying out and there's water dripping off the bottom and all that kind of stuff. It is a really, really fun airplane.
like I said, it's the only four-engine practical flying boat that I can think of today. So let me explain here. This is fascinating how we actually moor this. So after after I land the airplane, we got the guy down there in the little rubber dinghy. You know, if we need to, he basically, you know, can get out, uh, figure out what's going on if we have needs to go to shore or something. As I don't think we had cell phones back then when we brought this across. Anyway, so what happens is I land, we let the airplane uh, basically cool off, let the engines cool off for a little bit. And what I'll first do is I'll shut down the inboard engine. So we'll shut down number two and we'll shut down number three, okay? So then what happens is now I've got a mooring buoy that's going to be up ahead of me somewhere, you know, half a mile away, quarter mile away, or something like that, okay? So what happens is, is what I'll do, the problem is since there's no brakes on this airplane, and there's no reversible propellers, you have to be very careful. I've only ever once missed the buoy since uh, I brought it in, and it was when I was training, and we were flying out of the Solent, and there was a nine-foot tide. And so basically, on each of the mooring buoys, there's a little rope with a little small buoy, called like a telltale buoy, okay? And it kind of gives you an indication of where, where the wind's coming from. So obviously, if you're on a lake here in central Florida, what you would do is you would basically line up directly on that little telltale buoy, and you'd be going directly into the wind towards the buoy. Simple. Guess what? When the tide's moving and it's nine feet, it's the difference between the tide moving in the water and the wind, and I missed it one time, and that's the only time I missed it. So, And that was when I was learning. It was probably about my third or fourth time trying to moor the thing. So anyway, so here on the lake in Central Florida, it's a little easier. We have a little telltale buoy, so we line up on it, and I'm coming in from, I'm always doing a left turn because since I'm on the left side, the buoy would be like out over this way, okay? So I'm making a left turn. I've got the inboards shut down, okay? And what will happen is, is I'm coming around. I've got my flight engineer up, not flight engineer, but my bowsman basically up there. And when I get to a certain point, I'm going to go drop the left drogue. He's going to throw that left drogue out. It's a big wear water parachute. When it hits the water and catches, all of a sudden you can feel the airplane slow down and it's going to start turning faster to the left, okay? So I actually use that drogue to help me turn the boat to the left. And so then he's preparing the right one because now as I'm beginning to line up and the buoy is like over here and we're lining up when I finally line the buoy up and it lines up on the front, I tell him to drop the right drogue out. And now all of a sudden, boom, you know, the, it drops down. So now we're going slower. Well, guess what? If you still continue steering it this way, you're going to overrun the buoy. You're going to overrun the buoy, okay? So what happens is, is when you're, you're, you're taxiing along, you're still going too fast, you're going to overrun the buoy. So, so what happens is then, at some point, when I get it lined up the best I can, hopefully there's a little bit of a wind because it'll help me, then what happens is I bring the throttle out. These are already shut off. The, the two and three are already shut off. I bring one and four all the way in the back, all the way to the back to idle, and I never touch them again. Okay, so now how am I going to steer? I'm still going too fast to steer the deal, but I'm still pretty far away, so I'm, can, you know, I got time to slow down. So what happens is, is at that point, I basically start sailing the airplane. So if I rotate this over to right aileron, you can't see it, but basically that left aileron on that side, that left aileron goes down, okay? Because if I want to bank to the right, that one's going to go down, and the one on the starboard side is going to go up. So the airplane would bank like this. But what that does, with the wind blowing at me, is by dropping that aileron, it creates more drag on the left side, and very, very slowly the boat will start turning like this, and because of the hole being lined up, I start turning to the left. So I literally begin sailing not only with the ailerons, you know, see the rudder has a different lock somewhere and I'm not sure where that is. But anyway, so then I'm, I'm steering with the, uh, the, the rudder with my feet. I'm steering with the ailerons here. So if I want to go to the right, I turn the wheel to the left. That aileron drops. No, anyway, yeah, left aileron, 
that aileron drops, and I turn to right. So if I want to go to the right, I turn the wheel to the left. The right aileron goes down, creates more drag, and the airplane starts turning this way. It, it's very slow acting, uh, and it doesn't respond quickly, but it's the only thing you can do. Okay, I'm still, if there's no wind, I'm still going too fast, I'm going to overrun the buoy. So once I get this thing like really, really close, now all of a sudden what I do is up here, I basically, uh, two is shut off, three is shut off, and I've got this, uh, I've got one, one on the port side and four on the starboard side up there. And these are in here like this. So now what I do to steer is I've got this hand on here, I got this hand on here, and I start shutting the engines off to slow it down. And if I want to go to the left, okay, I shut this one off. The right engine is still running. This one drops off and it starts turning to the left but before it quits I push the switch back in so I'm basically I'm really kind of coming in like a World War One airplane blip 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 and that's the way you steer it and then when you finally get up there and it's lined up and then of course I'm looking for the the bowsman up on the front to tell me to go this way to go this way because I can't see the buoy the buoy is underneath the front of the airplane at some point I can't see where it is so if he's telling me it's like this blah 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 and then all of a sudden you know and when I know we're getting slower and he's telling me to slow down or something like this you know I'm just pushing these things both in and out at the same time if I'm lined up and when he finally gets it he's got a big mooring hook down there he connects it up off the buoy he picks it up, he gives me a thumbs up, and that's when I shut the mags off. And that's when the bottle pops pop off the Make It in Jamaica rum, and we're off having a good time. Make it in Jamaica. Anyway, with that, um, let's get out of here, because I am off to a design and development meeting for Act 3 with my designers, and the more sit up here talking to you guys the longer it's going to take for me to get a place to get this thing going to fly it again. Kermit Weeks, Short Sunderland, Fantasy of Flight, out for now. <laughs>